What's up? I'm Pastor Todd, and this is Pastor Daphne. We want to thank you so much for watching the message today. We believe it will impact your life. We do want to thank you for joining us. We hope to see you face to face if you're ever in the Seminole area. But we hope this message will be a blessing to you. Y'all ready for the word today? Let's jump right into it. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 15. How many is expecting today? Come on, how many is expecting today? Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 15. Today we're going to start a new series entitled Focus. Focus. How many ever had to tell your kids that? Focus. My, I still tell my kids that. Focus. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Let me just stop right there. Now, you realize, and I don't want to go too far into this up front, but this is written to the church at Ephesus, and what kind of reputation this church had was amazing. Paul had actually heard of one, they heard of their faith. This church at Ephesus, they heard of their faith and their love. Two major marks for a church that is led by God is faith and love. And it's amazing. I believe that's what we have here at our church. Sure, we're growing in faith, and sure, we're always going to be learning how to walk in love with one another. But what better reputation to have in a community than faith and love? Now, let's go on, verse number 16. Do not cease to give thanks for you, make a mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is his great, exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet, and he gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, we know, because we've talked about this set of scriptures many, many times, this is Paul's prayer to the church at Ephesus. And one of the things we've been looking at in our previous series entitled Purpose is that there's two types of churches that the Bible talks about. The universal church, which is when a believer accepts Jesus as their personal Savior, they become a part of the family or part of the universal church. And there's churches all over the world that are meeting today, right now. And we, as believers, are all a part of the universal church, but also also, there's what's called the local church, and the majority of the New Testament was written to local churches or pastors of a local church. So it's important for all of us, especially in these last days, to be a part of a local church. Can I get an amen? Now, sure, we're all a part of the body of Christ and, and all of that amazing. It's amazing that we all are. You can go to all kinds of different places in the world, and you can still have church because they're a part of the body of Christ. But there's just something about going to a local church like Transformation Church in Seminole. It's a local church, and Paul specifically writing to a local church, the church at Ephesus. And let me kind of put some things in perspective for you today, hear about the church of Ephesus. It became the largest church in all of Asia Minor. Other churches were actually birthed from this church in Ephesus. Paul, he actually lived in Ephesus for three months, and he founded that church there. The following year, he moved back and um, stayed after he traveled for three years. And at the end of those three years, Paul left to travel again and ministered the gospel all over that region. Paul wrote this letter, this letter to the church at Ephesus while sitting in a, a jail cell in Rome. Now check this out. Paul, he was writing to all of the believers, these converts of his ministry, and speci specifically those that were in Ephesus, obviously. But when Paul placed Timothy as the pastor of this church, there was forty to 60,000 members of that church at that time. Many Bible scholars believe that. Forty to 60,000 members. Now, we have a community, our, our uh, city, I guess our, what am I want to say, our, our, inside the city limits, our population is about 6,500 people. Can you imagine going to a church of forty to 60,000 people? Wow. Now, check this out. They were all church members. In the first three months of Timothy being the pastor, that church grew an additional 30,000 members. 
approximately 10,000 converts a month. A lot of amazing things was going on in the midst of when Paul was writing this letter. Now, Timothy, he ended up pastoring this church, and this church ended up to being about seventy to 90,000 people. I mean, oh, that's what we would call today a mega church. But the Spirit of God was still moving. There was amazing miracles that were taking place. But there was something that you can read later on in the book of Revelations. In fact, the church at Ephesus was known, in fact, was rebuked because they lost their first love. So there was amazing growth. There was awesome things that was going on. There was, there was a move of God that was taking place in, in all of that area there where the church of Ephesus was at. The church was growing. But in the end, somehow along the way, they lost their first love. I want to say this, in these last days, because of all the drama that's going on, all the things that's going on in our country and even in the world, we must not lose sight of our first love. It's all about Jesus, y'all. It's all about loving on Jesus. It's all about preaching and teaching the Word and allowing the Spirit of God to move. Let's look at verse number 18. Verse number 18, again, says this, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. Let's break this down. I like to kind of teach and preach a little bit. Let's break this down. Look at the word eyes. This word eyes is translated to, to having vision. To sing, to have vision. How many know it's important to have vision? Without vision, the people perish. And Paul, he was praying that their vision would, would lighten up. It goes on that the eyes of your understanding, this word understanding, it actually means your heart. Where your heart, your heart, where you gain understanding. Really, in the Bible, the heart is your very essence of life. It goes on, this word enlightens, it means to brighten up. So when Paul prayed this part in verse number 18, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, he was basically saying, I want you to have fresh vision. I want the vision that God's given you to lighten up, to brighten up. He wants our heart to come back on fire again for God. That the eyes of our understanding be enlightened. He was praying that the church, this church at Ephesus, would have vision in their heart, and that vision would become brighter and brighter. It's so important for us in these last days to have vision, and have vision according to what God wants for our lives. Now, how many received one of these 3D glasses when you came in? You're like, what in the world are we going to do with these? Well, as I was praying for this service, I, the Lord kind of impressed on my heart about these 3D glasses. And what we're going to do here, we're going to put on this screen back here, an actual 3D screen. So put your glasses on if you so wish. If you didn't get a pair of glasses, I'm looking out there. Everybody looks really weird like this. Now, as you look at this screen, you can see that the, the fish are, like, coming at you kind of. And in the background, you kind of see all the seaweed and all that kind of fun stuff. Let me know that when you have these glasses on, you see a whole lot more clear. Now, let's take these 3D glasses off. Wow, everything's kind of fuzzy. Everything's kind of different. How many ever been to a movie theater before? And it was a 3D movie. And I remember, I think it was Avatar or something like that was 3D. And I remember going in there and thinking, man, I've heard about this. It's supposed to be like the top of the top, the best of the best. It's an amazing, you know, movie. I couldn't wait to, to go watch it. So we get our 3D glasses and, and um, go into the movie theater and... That, that moment comes when you put it on, and I'm thinking, at first, I'm thinking, all right, this is pretty cool. And I'm watching the movie, and it was like, just like kind of like what we saw. I was like, man, this is cool, but I'm going to take my glasses off for a little while because they were kind of bugging my nose, and it just it was getting in my way. I thought, well, I can hear. If it's a little fuzzy, that's all right. So I took my glasses off, and as I'm watching the movie, I'm looking around at everybody else, like some of you still have your glasses on. That's awesome. And I'm kind of looking around, and as I'm looking, everybody's watching. But when a certain instance took place in the movie where something came at them, they kind of jumped back. And they kind of went, oh, whoa. It's just because they could see with their 3D glasses what was going on. And I didn't see it. I missed it because I didn't have my glasses on. What Paul was basically praying for, for the church at Ephesus, that they would put their 3D glasses on that they could see what the Spirit of God was trying to do in their church, that they could see what God had planned for their lives, he could, that they could see actually God's revelation light that would change their hearts. But it's interesting how some people, even whenever I asked you to put your glasses on, you didn't. 
And for whatever reason, that's fine. Whatever you did, you're like, I'm not going to be weird like my neighbor. And again, there's still some people that still have the glasses on now. That's great. They're still getting a better picture of what we have. They don't have our glasses on. It's interesting. When God gives us 3D glasses to see, it's our choice to put it on. That's what this whole series is about, is focus. What are you focusing on? When we ask God to give us wisdom and revelation, we're actually taking what God has already given us through his word, and we're putting these 3D glasses on. Why? So we can see better. Because many Christians are not wearing their 3D glasses. They're not catching the focus of what God's trying to do in these last days. They're not really have any kind of vision to see what God wants for their lives. They're more concerned about what the media is saying, about what the elections are going to do or not do. They're more focused on the economy, what could happen, what hasn't happened, what possibly will never happen. They're more focused on that, and they really can't see what's going on on the screen of their life because they're not putting on their 3D glasses. They're not putting on what God's Word says about their life. Look at your neighbor and say, you need to focus. Find somebody and say, you need to focus. Here's some facts about staying focused or being focused. Turn to Luke chapter 24, verse number 13. Luke chapter 24, verse number 13. This is a story that took place, a historical account of what the Bible calls the road to Emmaus. Verse number 13. Now behold, two of them were traveling the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. And so it was when they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so they didn't know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk in our sad? But the one whose name was Caiaphas, I can't pronounce his name, Caleb, how do you pronounce the name? You know, I wish they had Texas names like John or, or Jim Bob. You know, we're in Texas, Jim Bob or something like that. Anyway, yeah, answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet, mighty indeed, in word before God and all the people. And now the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were all hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and a certain woman of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they had finished, when they... When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And a certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it was just as the women had said, but he did not see. But they did not see. Verse number 25. Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart. Notice this. O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to a village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road, while he opened the scriptures to us? Now, there's a whole lot that just happened in this section of scriptures. We find that Jesus had just arisen from the dead. The body wasn't in the tomb. I've seen the tomb personally just earlier this year. His body's not there. He's alive. But not only that, they were all questioning if Jesus really was the Messiah, in essence, because they were hoping that he would take over the world and would rule the world. But they were thinking more from a natural point of view and not from a spiritual point of view. Look at verse number 16. 
but their eyes were restrained so they did not know him. Let me say this about focus. Your focus can be so off and so bad that Jesus can be walking with you and you won't even know it. You can love Jesus, you can go to church, you can do all the amazing things that we do as Christians, but in times of need, in times of of darkness, in the times when things are falling apart, do we keep our focus so much on all the negative things that we forget that even Jesus is right there with us? Verse number 17, and he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and notice this, and are sad? There's something else about vision that you need to know about focus. Sadness is always going to be a sign of wrong focus. Sadness is always going to be a sign of wrong focus. Now, there's a lot of sad things going on in the world today. There's a lot of negative things going on in the world today. But it's one thing to know it. It's another thing not to stay focused on it. Faith is going to look past all the negativity and see what God's Word says about it. But so many times we as believers can forget that Jesus is with us inadvertently, unintentionally forget that he's with us, and we can be so focused on all the negative things that's going on in the world that it actually changes our demeanor. It actually robs us of faith. We're sad, we're depressed, we're mad all the time because everything is going wrong. Sadness is always going to be a sign of wrong focus. Jump down to verse number 21. But we were hoping that it was... He who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our country who arrived, or our company, who arrived at the tomb early astounded us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And a certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said. But he... They did not see. Notice something here. This whole conversation, they were focused more on the natural things that was going on instead of the supernatural things that just took place for three days. They were so focused on, well, this, and the tomb's empty, and and he promised this, and all this kind of other stuff. I mean, we can be so focused on all the natural things in our life that we forget that God's doing some supernatural things in our midst. You can go back and watch our YouTube uh, service last week. We talked about all the amazing revivals and miracles that have been just taking place in the last 40 to 50 years all over the world. Amazing things are happening. Jesus is returning, and he's coming soon. The world is going to get worse, but the church is going to get brighter and brighter in these last days. I believe that we are not only in revival, but we've been walking in revival for 40 years now, 50 years now. There has been great things that have happened all over the world, and a virus can't change a vision from God. A virus can't change what God is doing in these last days. Verse number 27, and at the beginning, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures of things was concerning him. Now, Let's picture this for a moment. Let's all put us in that situation. We're walking with Jesus, not knowing it's really Jesus. And then Jesus, or this this strange man, comes and he starts preaching to us on the road. Now, hold up. These guys was with Jesus, and then this guy's showing up, and he's preaching about Jesus. That's how blinded they were actually to the fact that Jesus, the greatest preacher that ever was, was preaching about himself to them. How many times have been around people that they do something that's just crazy, just not, not all there, and you look at them like, how many of you are just like, hello? <laughs> oh, come on, you're looking at me like that now. <laughs> you're just like, I'm trying to think of examples, but I don't want to use any of my family members because I get in trouble every time I do that. Thank you, Ms. Staffy said, thank you. Jesus preached the word to them. The word of God is what will always realign our focus. Regardless of what's going on around us, the word of God will realign our focus to where we can put on our glasses again and see what God has for us. Verse number 31, then their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. Notice something, after he preached the word to them, their eyes were opened. Again, the word was ministered to them, 
and their eyes were open. The Word of God will always realign your focus. I've seen this in the past six months with all the things that's going on. The believers that have had the greatest struggle, we all have struggled in one way or another. There's been all kinds of challenges in one way or another. The ones that have, it would appear, that were struggling the most are the ones that because of the struggle, the challenges that they're facing, they stop getting into the Word as much. They, they, they've stopped studying the Word. They've stopped being in church as much. They've stopped getting fed the Word of God. And I've seen many people, I've been even tempted at times, many people just kind of fall away from God. They love Jesus. They love all that, but they kind of are not as passionate. They lost their first love because the signs of the times have been so challenging. But we as a church, we must realign our focus And the Word of God is what realigns our focus. It opens up our eyes to see all that God has called us to do. Look at verse number 32. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked to us on the road and while he opened up the Scriptures to us? Notice something that happened deep inside of the core of their being. Their hearts burned. There was a burning for more of what he had to say. Their focus was on the Word, which in turn caused their hearts to be set on fire. When you change your focus, listen, listen. When you change your focus, you restore your heart. When you change your focus, you restore your heart. Whenever they heard the Word being preached to them, when they heard all the things from Moses through the prophets and about Jesus and and all the things he was preaching, there was something that was happening to them. Not only did their eyes, Jesus is here with us, but something on the inside of them was changing. They said, did not our hearts burn within us? It's so important in these days to stay focused, to stay focused on what God's Word says. Don't allow all the drama going on. Don't allow what all the media is saying, what everybody's saying, to cause you to lose your focus. Stay focused on what God's Word says. Stay focused that this is our year for milk and honey. Stay focused that he is still in the blessing business. He still wants his children blessed in these days. Stay focused that he's your healer. Stay focused that the blood of Jesus not only cleanses us of sin, but protects us, keeps us safe in all of these wicked and evil times. Plead the blood of Jesus over your house and just declare, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord in these last days. We're going to keep our glasses on. We're going to stay focused in these last days. Psalms 119, verse 37, you can write this scripture down, says this. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. His prayer, the psalmist's prayer was, man, turn my eyes. When I'm starting looking at worthless things, turn them away. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. When you're fumbling through Facebook and all the social media stuff and you've been on it for hours, Man, just say, Lord, help me revive my eyes. Turn my eyes away from all of this worthless things. Now, let me balance this out. I'm so thankful for Brother Hagin. He had a a balanced approach to everything in his life. We should be aware of what's going on in our world today. We cannot just stand and be just, you know, oblivious to all the things that's going on. But our focus is more on what God is doing in the midst of all the stuff that's going on. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 25, the New Living's translation says this, Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 29, Jesus said, If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Now, Jesus was not actually talking about getting that coat hanger and doing that to your right eye. He's talking about vision. He's talking about if you're you're losing sight of what God's called you to do, quit it. Stop looking at that. Stop being more focused on that than what God's Word says about it. Turn back to Luke chapter 24, verse number 30. Y'all still with me today? Luke chapter 24, verse number 30. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread and blessed it and broke it, and he gave it to them. 
Then their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. Now, let me say this. Even though Jesus vanished from the sight, he was still with them. Now, notice something. He sat at the table with them and took bread. Today we're going to take communion. I believe that, you know, we, we, we're not necessarily sure if they actually took communion at this time, but he still broke bread. As John comes up and he begins to play the piano, I, I want us to take some time here. Because what took place here is when he sat down at the table with them and he took bread, he blessed it and broke it and he gave it to them. Then, somebody say then. Then their eyes were open. Just something about taking communion. It's just something about when a church comes together like this and we take communion. I believe what's going to happen by the Spirit of the living God, that as you take these elements, you're going to get some fresh vision. It's just going to be supernatural. The things you've been praying about, the things you've been wondering about, the things that you're uneasy about, you're not sure of, there's power in activating your faith in these communion elements. Now, the bread and the cup, they don't have any power. It's our faith in what Jesus did and what it symbolizes. I believe that you're going to get some fresh vision from heaven. I believe your focus is going to be realigned today. Just like what happened with Jesus as he was at the table with them and took bread. At this time, we have ushers that's going to hand out these elements, and because of just all the stuff that's going on, we, we, we put them in the containers here. If you would, please just take one per person here, and we're not going to open them yet. I have some more things I want to tell you before we do that. It's so important that we never forget our first love. You know, I, I was born again at the age of five. I was filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues at the age of eight. I'm a preacher's kid. I've been around church all of my life. In fact, I don't, I don't know anything else. There was a couple years that I went through a rebellious time. You guys know my story, drugs, all that kind of stuff. But I was just running from God. But when I came back, I, I made the decision that I was going all out, all in with this walk of Christianity. What took place those many, many years ago when I rededicated my life to the Lord is that God got a hold of me. He got my attention, and he realigned my focus for my life. Now, many of you might be here today, and you're like, you're living for God. You're doing good. You're not, you're not the prodigal son like I was that needs to come back home. But down deep inside of you, you know that your heart has kind of grown callous to some things. Your heart maybe has been, you know, poked at by the Holy Ghost of, hey, you need to change this. You don't need to be doing this anymore. You don't need to be watching this anymore. You don't need to be, you know, hanging out with these kind of people that are doing this anymore. You need to make some adjustments. Maybe it's even a business deal that, that you've been praying about and you haven't got any answers yet. You, you need some direction with a business deal. I, I want you to know the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him is here right now. I believe that as we take communion together, your eyes are going to be enlightened. Your heart is going to burn just like those that walk with Jesus on the road to Emmaus. Something's going to shift inside of your spirit, man. How many can hook up with me today and believe that? Something's going to shift inside of you. There's power in taking these elements together. We were um, preparing for the Reach Outreach yesterday. And and I was actually preparing for this message. I had no idea we was going to do the communion. Usually we talk about it as a ministry team. And the Lord just prompted me. He just said, now's the time. There's people that will be at that service and will be watching online that will need to hear. Thank you, sir. That will need to hear that their focus is all messed up and they need to get their focus realigned back to what he has told them to do. So today is your day. Hallelujah. I said, today is your day. God knew you were going to be here today. You're not here by accident. God knew you were going to be in this service today. God knew you are going to be watching online today. This was not something that's just unusual or something that just, just, just happened. No, God planned this. And because he planned it, I believe he's going to open up our eyes. We're going to see things. We're going to get revelation. I'm actually, I believe in God for some things for 2021. Amen. We're coming to the end of this year. I'm thankful for this year. 
A lot of people are ready to get 2020 over with. I've had a great year, and that's not just a confession of faith. It's been a great year. Has there been challenges? Absolutely. But, man, how can you grow if you're not challenged? I, mean, I, I welcome challenges, I'm, but I'm, I'm, I'm the guy that sees the cup full and not empty. I'm, I'm just, I'm that kind of guy. And I know there's been people that have struggled and have a hard time, and I'm not trying to belittle that. And, and, and I'm, I'm thankful for 2020 because it's revealed a lot about us. But I'm looking forward to 2021. So I'm already starting to pray out 2021, what the Lord has for us. Amen? So if you want to know what I'm specifically praying out, I'm praying out some things for 2021. Get some fresh vision for my life for that. Amen? So let's, let's just pray. Father, thank you so much for your holy, precious word. We're so thankful for what you're going to do in this service. I believe you're going to open up eyes, realign our focus, change our focus on some things. In Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. First Corinthians chapter 11. Let me read this to you before we partake today. Paul, he, he's writing this, verse number 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Verse 27, Therefore whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Verse 28, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Before we partake of these elements here, we're going to have just a, a moment here. I'm going to pray. I want you to pray. I want you to do some, some soul searching, I guess you say. I want you to do a gut check. Where are you at spiritually? What's going on? Are you, are you strong? Is your level on a scale of 1 to 10, you're at that 9, 10 level. You're doing great. And thank God for that. But is there some areas that you believe the Holy Spirit is going to show you and tell you what you need to do, your next step in this season? Maybe you're spiritually at a 1, 2, 3. Maybe you're at a, a negative, <laughs> wherever you're at. I believe that as we judge ourselves in this moment, as we go before the Lord, and as we examine ourselves, we lay aside all the hindrances, all the stuff. I believe that that's what God's going to speak to us clearly, reveal His plan for our lives, realign our focus. So let's pray. You pray also. Heavenly Father, we just want to great. We're just so grateful for you. We're so thankful for your son, Jesus. And we just believe that you're going to do some amazing things in this moment. Lord, I know your God, and that you would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation of the knowledge of you. Our eyes will be open. We'll see and know all that you have for us today. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's lift up this bread. If you rip the top part of that cup off, just grab the bread. Let's just lift it up. Jesus, we recognize today that this, this piece of bread, this loafer, is, has no power to it, but it's a symbol of your body that was broken for us. And we're so thankful that you died on the cross, you rose again on the third day, that you're seated in heavenly places. And we're seated with you in those very heavenly places. Lord, I believe that as we break this bread and as we partake of this bread, you're opening up our eyes to see and know all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, let's break the bread and take it. Let's hold up the cup. Hallelujah. Are you thankful for the blood of Jesus? 
This is just grape juice. There's really no power in the juice itself. It's just a symbol of the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. And it's not only just for our sins, but like we said other, uh, earlier, it protects us. It keeps us safe. It puts the devil on the run. It does so many amazing things for us. And when we plead the blood of Jesus over our life, we live in that victorious place. It's where the blood is, Satan can't be. So let's just thank him, lift up the cup, and let's pray, Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. Lord, I'm so thankful for you, Jesus, the blood that you shed for us. Thank you right now that you're revealing your heart to us, realigning focus in Jesus' name. Let's be taking the cup. Hallelujah. Once you do this, stand to your feet. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Come on across this place. Let's just lift up our hands and let's just thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for giving us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. The eyes of our understanding be enlightened. That we may know what is the hope of our calling. What are the riches of the glory of the inheritance of the saints? What is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him in heavenly places, far above all principality, power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named. Not only in this age, but that which is to come. And he gave him to be the head over all things, to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So we're thankful. Come on, let's thank him today. Church, just lift up your, just thank him. Say, thank you, Lord, for fresh vision. Lord, thank you for realigning my focus. I thank you, Lord. I see and know your plan. Re re revealing your plan in Jesus' name. Thank you for the answer. Just like you did at the road to Emmaus and how as you broke bread for them and their eyes were open. Lord, I believe in this moment, right here, right now, you're opening up eyes to see and know. Clarity, cl clear, clear, bringing clarity to people, seeing things clearly in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, your purpose and your plan. Hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Father. You're so good. Glory to God. Glory, glory, glory to your Father. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you, God, for seeing and knowing. Thank you, Lord, for discernment in the name, the gifts of the Spirit. Hallelujah. The gifts of the Spirit flowing in the word of wisdom, words of knowledge. Hallelujah. Signs, wonders, miracles, Lord. Prophetic gifts flowing in these last days in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, seeing and knowing. We see and know. We have an auction. We have an anointing from the Holy One. And we know all things. In the name of Jesus. With everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today or watching online. And as I was talking about my brief testimony of what God has done for me, and you're like, yeah, I was that. I'm, I, I lived that way, and I'm kind of living that way now. I was going to church. I was on fire for God. But I, all the stuff that's going on, I've just kind of left God on the side and just kind of live in my own way. Maybe you've never prayed a simple prayer. Jesus, come into my heart. Take away my sin. I want the assurance that I'm going to heaven and not hell. If that's you today, I know everybody's standing, but that's all right. If that's you today, if you're watching online, wherever you're at, just raise your hand and say, yeah, I need to come back home to Jesus. I need, I need to have that assurance that I'm going to heaven and not hell. Thank you for raising your hand. Is there anybody else? Thank you, Lord. Is there anybody else in this place? Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for that in the back. Amen. Glory to God. I want you to do this. If you raise your hand and everybody else here, just put your hand over your heart today. And just repeat this after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I stand in your presence, and I need a Savior. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross. And when you died on the cross, you took away my sin. But you're alive today, and you're sitting in, the, in, in heavenly places. I confess 
Jesus, you're my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sin. From this day forward, I'm a new person. The past is gone. A new life has begun. Fill me with your spirit right now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Today's a good day. There's angels in heaven shouting the glory today. People getting saved. Hallelujah. Hey, if you're watching online, thank you so much. If you prayed that prayer, just let us know in the comments that you prayed that prayer. We'll have somebody that will contact you. Hey, right before we leave, don't forget, grab a box. We want everybody to get a box. If you got two people in your family, get two. And I believe that we're going to reach our community for Jesus. And this is just one of those ways we do that as an act of love. So as you leave today, just know this, that God is alive. And we're going to reach this world for Jesus. You guys are dismissed. Have a wonderful day. God bless you. We'll see you later.